This is lecture five that I'm going to start by going over homework problems. Um, so, more problems. So, in section 1.4, which is on Gaussian elimination. Let me look at um, number 5a. So we have two equations, 3x minus y plus z plus 2w equals 12, and minus 2x plus 3y plus 7z minus 10w equals minus 15. So the coefficients are 3, minus 1, 1, 2, 12, minus 2, 3, 7, minus 10, minus 15. So the first step is to have the coefficient of x in the first equation equal to 1. So I can multiply the first equation by a third. If I multiply by a third, I get x minus a third y plus a third z plus two thirds w equals four. And the second equation isn't changed. So we have this system of two equations and four unknowns, which is equivalent to the original system. Then I want to eliminate the x from the second equation. I want to get rid of that. So I keep my first equation, x minus a third y plus a third z plus two thirds w equals four. And I add two times the first equation to the second equation. So 2x minus 2x is 0. The x disappears. I have minus 2 thirds plus 3. So minus 3 minus 2 thirds is 7 thirds. I have 7 thirds y. 2 thirds plus 7 is 23 thirds z. 4 thirds minus 10. So 10 minus 4 thirds is 26 thirds. So this is minus 26, 3 over w, and minus, multiplying this by 2, 8 minus 15 is minus 7. So if I did my arithmetic correctly, this is now my second equation. And let me just double check, because it's hard to do fractions correctly. I'm adding 2 times the first equation to the second. 2x minus 2x is 0. 3 minus 2 thirds is 7 thirds. 7, oh, here's so good. I made a mistake. No, I'm adding twice. Uh, 3 minus 2 thirds. 7 plus 2 thirds is 23 thirds. Minus 10 plus 4 thirds. Minus 10 plus 4 thirds is minus 26 thirds. And minus 15 plus 8 is minus 7. So this is my second system. Then I want the coefficient of y in the second equation to be 1. So my first equation at this point doesn't change. But I multiply the second equation by 3 over 7. So that gives me y plus 23 over 7 minus 26 over 7, this is a z, minus 26 over 7 w, 3 over 7 times minus 7 is minus 3. So I'm multiplying by 3 over 7. Okay. Then I want to eliminate the y in the first equation. So my second equation doesn't change y plus 23 over 7 
z minus 26 <clears throat> over 7w equals minus 3. And I add one third the second equation to the first equation. <clears throat> so x plus 0 is x. A third y minus a third y is 0. 23, a third, 23 over 7 times 3. So I have a little 23 over 7 times a third is 23 over 21 plus a third, which is 7 over 21. So this is 30 over 7 z minus 26 over 7 times a third is minus 26 over 21 plus two thirds, which is 14 over 21. So this is minus 12 over 21, which is minus four over seven. Minus four over seven w. And if I multiply this by a third, I get minus one plus four equals three. So if I was lucky and did my arithmetic correctly, this is now my second set of equations, uh, or this is my set of equations, which has exactly the same solutions. That means is equivalent to the first set. So 23 over seven plus seven over 21 was 30 over 21, which was 10 over seven. Oops, oh, sorry, I made a mistake here. Good. So a third of this, 23 over seven times a third is 23 over 21, plus a third, which is seven over 21. That's 30 over 21, which is 10 over seven. It should be a 10 over seven. Good. And minus 26 over seven times three is minus 26 over 21, plus two thirds, which is 14. That's minus 12 over 21 which is minus four over seven. And multiply this by a third, and now I get three. So hopefully I did all the arithmetic correct. And now this is as reduced as is possible. So in any solution, x and y satisfies these equations. So this is the end of the Gaussian elimination algorithm. Now we can write down the solution. x is going to be 3 minus 10 over 7 z plus 4 over 7 w. And y is going to be equal to minus 3 minus 23 over 7 z plus 26 over 7 w for any x and y. So any solution of this system of equations must have the following form. x, y, z, w equals what? x is 3 minus 10 over 7z plus 4 over 7w. y is minus 3 minus 23 over 7z plus 26 over 7w. z is z and w is w. So every solution of the system of equations must have this form. This is, I can write this as the vector 3 minus 3, 0, 0 plus z times the vector minus 10 over 7, minus 23 over 7, 1, 0, plus w times the vector 4 over 7, 26 over 7, 0, and 1. And that is the general solution of this system of equations. Let's just check that three minus three zero zero is a particular solution.
So if I have 3x minus y plus z plus 2w, if I let x equal 3 and y be minus 3, <coughs> and z and w <coughs> equal to 0, this is 9 plus 3, or 12. So that checks. The second equation is minus 2x plus 3y plus 7z minus 10w. So that's minus 2 times 3 plus 3 times minus 3 plus 7 times 0 minus 10 times 0. This is minus 6 minus 9 is minus 15. So that checks. So So this is a particular solution of the equation. And if we let W be the vector subspace or just subspace generated by these two vectors, minus 10 over seven, minus 23 over seven, one zero, and the other vector is 4 over 7, 26 over 7, 0, 1. So if W is the subspace generated by these two vectors, then the solution of the system is the affine subspace L equal to this fixed vector 3 minus 3, 0, 0 plus W. <laughs> so that is using Gaussian elimination to solve a system of equations. Any questions about this? Okay. Let's look at something in section 1.6, which is very important. Section 1.6. So as we look at exercise one. So this depends on the very important concept of linear dependence and linear independence. So we have vectors v1, v2, up to v sub k are linearly dependent if There exist scalars, numbers C1, C2, up to C sub K, not all zero. Some of them can be zero, but they can't all be zero, such that the linear combination C1, V1 plus C2, V2 uh, to CK VK is equal to the zero vector. And the vectors V1, V2 up to V sub K are called linearly independent 
if they're not linearly dependent. So, or equivalently, if whenever C1, C2 up to C sub K are scalars, such that the linear combination C1 and V1 up to CK, VK equals zero, then necessarily all of the constants, all the scalars are equal to zero. So there's no non-trivial linear combination of the vectors that gives zero. So in part A of this problem, we have the two vectors, V1 is equal to zero, two, and V2 is three, zero. So suppose C1, C2 are scalars, and C1, V1 plus C2, V2 equals zero. That means, so C1, V1 plus C2, V2, that's C1 times the vector zero, two, plus C2 times the vector three, zero. This is the vector zero, two, C1, and this is the vector three, C2, zero. When you add them, you get three, C2, two, C1. So this linear combination of vectors is equal to this, this vector. And that's equal to the zero vector if and only if 3C2 and 3C1 are both equal to zero, which happens if and only if C1 and C2 equal zero. So therefore, these vectors are linearly independent. The only linear combination of the vectors that gives you the zero vector is the trivial linear, co linear combination when both scalars are zero. Any questions about this? This is a basic thing to learn in linear algebra. What about 1b? Here we have two vectors, v1 equal 1, 2, and v2 equal 2, 1. So we consider a linear combination, c1, v1 plus c2, v2. That's c1 times the vector 1, 2, and c2 times the vector 2, 1. That's c1, 2, c1, plus 2, c2, c2. And when you add, you get C1 plus 2C2, 2C1 plus C2. And so this is a linear combination of C1. This is the linear combination, C1, V1 plus C2, V2. You get this vector. And when is that equal to zero? If and only if the first coordinate is zero and the second coordinate is equal to zero. So we have to find what are all solutions of this system of two equations and two unknowns. So we can do, we can use any technique we like for solving linear equations. The first equation, C1 plus two C2 equals zero. If I subtract two times the first equation from the second, I get two C1 minus two C1 is zero. C2 minus four C2, is minus three two three c two equals zero. So this system is equivalent to this, but this says c two is zero, and if c two is zero, c one is zero. So if you have a linear combination of these two vectors equal to the zero vector, both scalars are zero. So these vectors are linearly independent. Let's look at 1c. We have the vector v1 is minus 4, 7, and v2 is the same vector, minus 4, 7. So you could just say, looking at this, that v1 
1 times v1 plus minus 1 times v2. That's v1 minus v2. But these are equal vectors. You get 0, 0. So what does this mean? The coefficients of v1 and v2 are not 0. But this linear combination gives the 0 vector. So the sequence of vectors v1, v2 is linearly dependent. They're not independent. So the ability to determine if a set of vectors is linearly dependent or independent, very important. Okay. Let's look at one or two more. Suppose I take, um, in problem two, part D. I have the vector V1 is 5 minus 2, 1. The vector V2 is 1 minus 2, 5. The vector 3, 3 is 1, 1 minus 4. Is this sequence of three vectors linearly dependent or linearly independent? So we have to consider what is a linear combination? C1, V1, plus C2, V2, plus C3, V3. What does this look like? This is C1 times the vector mi 5 minus 2, 1, plus C2 times the vector 1 minus 2, 5, plus C3 times the vector 1, 1 minus 4. So this is 5C1 minus 2C1, C1. This is C1 minus C2 minus 2C2, 5C2. This is C3, C3 minus 4C3. When I add these vectors, I get 5C1 plus C2 plus C3 minus 2C1, minus 2C2, C3, C1 plus 5C2, minus 4C3. So this is what every linear combination of these vectors looks like. <clears throat> and the question is, for what possible choices of scalars, C1, C2, C3, does this give you the zero vector? So this is equivalent to solving three equations and three unknowns. So that everything comes down to solving linear equations. 5C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals zero. Minus 2C1 minus 2C2 plus C3 equals zero. And C1 plus 5C2 minus 4C3 equals zero. We have to solve this system of three equations and three unknowns. 5, 1, 1, minus 2, minus 2, 1, 1, 5, minus 4. So let's just solve it by Gaussian elimination. I want the coefficient of C1 in the first equation to be 1. I could multiply this equation by a fifth and get some fractions. It's easier because you're allowed to interchange equations if I interchange equations one and three. So the third equation is here. The second equation doesn't change. And the third equation is now, the, is what had been the first equation.
And then what do I want to do next? I want to eliminate the C1s from the second and third equations. So I have my first equation, C1 plus 5C2 minus 4C3 equals zero. If I add two times the first equation to the second, that kills the C1. 2C1 minus 2C1 is zero. 10 minus two is eight. Minus eight plus one is minus seven. That's the new second equation. So let me five C1 here, I add minus five times the first equation to the third. Minus five plus five is zero. Minus 25 plus one is minus 24 C2. 20 minus five times this is plus 20 plus one plus 21 C3 is zero. Right. So that's an equivalent system. I want to make <clears throat> this equation have the coefficient of C2 equal 1. Let me just divide by 8. So I'll just do it right now. So divide by 8, I get C2 and minus 7 over 8. So I don't have to do too much more work. Okay. Then, uh, so here I have in the second equation, the coefficient of C2 is 1. I want to eliminate C2 from the other equations, the first and the third. So my second equation is still C2 minus 7 C3 equals 0. If I take the first equation minus 5 times the second, I get C1. 5 minus 5 is 0. Minus 5 times this is minus 35 over 8. Sorry, minus five times this is plus 35 over eight, minus four, which is 32 over eight. So I get three eighths C3 is zero. And <clears throat> to eliminate the C2 here, I add 24 times the first equation to the third equation. 24 times the second equation to the third. 24 minus 24 is zero. <clears throat> if I multiply this by 24, eight into 24 is three. This is minus 21 plus 21. Oh, I get zero. So this second equation just becomes zero equals zero. So this is an equivalent system. This says, if I let C1 equal minus three eighths C3, and C2 equals 7 C3, for any C3, like one, I get a solution of <clears throat> this linear combination equal to zero. So therefore these vectors are linearly dependent. They're not independent. This just checks. Suppose I let C3 equals eight, then C1 is minus three, C2 is seven, C3 is eight. Let's just check if this works. If I take minus three V1 plus seven V2 plus eight V3, that's minus three times the vector five minus two one plus seven times the vector one minus two five plus eight times the vector one one minus four. So what is that? I have the first coordinate is minus 15 plus seven plus eight minus 15 plus 15 is zero. Here I get six minus 14 is minus eight plus eight is zero. Here I get minus three plus 35 is 32, minus 32 is zero. So I was lucky, I did all the work correctly and I found the answer and I checked. So in problem two part D, those three vectors are linearly dependent, right? Very nice to know.
Now, <clears throat> we actually come back to this set of vectors in problem five. So in problem five, we have the same vectors. V1 is five minus two, one. V2 is one minus two, five. And V3 is one, one minus four. So we just proved that these vectors are linearly dependent. So it's not the case that a vector, if it has a representation as a linear combination of these vectors, has a unique representation. And the problem is to find two distinct representations of the vector seven minus three, two. So we want to find C1, C2, C3, such that C1, V1 plus C2, V2 plus C3, V3 equals seven minus three, two. And we want to find two different sets of these triples. So again, if you take this linear combination, C1, V1, C2, V2, C3, that's equal to the vector, the C1, V1 plus C2, V2 plus C3, V3. I just calculated that. That's five C1 plus C2 plus C3, sorry, minus four C3, not plus C3, minus two C1 minus two C2, plus C3, and C1 plus 5C2 minus 4C3. And we want to solve for constant scalar C1, C2, C3, such that this equals the vector 7 minus 3, 2. So now we're solving an inhomogeneous system of linear equations. This equals 7. This equals minus 3. This equals 2. And so you can do some work and find the solutions. Actually, I can sort of see just looking at this, if I let C1, C2, C3 be the vector 1, 1, 1, plus 5 plus 1 plus 1 is 7, Minus two minus two is minus four, plus one is minus three. Six minus four is two. This is a solution. So the set of all solutions is the vector one, 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 plus every linear combination of the solution space of the homogeneous equation. Um, Minus three eighths, seven eighths, one times any scale where C3. <laughs> so we saw that this gives a solution of the homogeneous system of equations. This is from exercise 2D. And this is a particular solution of these equations. But you can also just do it. Uh, you have a system of three equations in three variables, inhomogeneous, solve the system of equations. This is what you'll find is the solution.
Okay. Questions about any of this? This is really all extremely important for us. Let me do another exercise. It wasn't one of the homework, but it's indicative of what you have to understand in this course. So this is exercise eight. Suppose we have V0, V1, V2 vectors in Rn such that the two vectors V1 minus V0 and V2 minus V0 are linearly independent. Prove that the vectors v0 minus v1 and v2 minus v1 are linearly independent. So we know that these two vectors are linearly independent. How do we show that these two vectors are linearly independent? So let's see. Let's see, so there's several ways to go about doing this. So let's say, suppose we have scalars C1, C2 that satisfy the condition that C1, V0 minus V1 plus C2, V2 minus V1 is the zero vector. Must show C1 and C2 are both equal to zero. That's the necessary and sufficient condition that this pair of vectors be linearly independent. So I guess I can look at this and I can notice that V2 minus V1, so this is note, is the same as V2 minus V0 minus V1 minus V0. Because the V0s cancel. And V0 minus V1 is minus V1 minus V0. So C1, V0 minus V1 plus C2, V2 minus V1. This is C1, V0 minus V1 is minus V1 minus V0. So this is minus C1, V1 minus V0. And C2 times V2 minus V1 is V2 minus V0 minus V1 minus V0. So this is minus C1, V1 minus V0, plus C2, V2 minus V0, minus C2, V1 minus V0. If I collect these two terms, I have minus C1 minus C2. So minus C1 plus C2, V1 minus V0, plus C2, V2 minus V0. And we're told this is the zero vector. 
But so this linear combination of V0 minus V1 and V2 minus V1 can be rewritten as a linear combination of V1 minus V0 and V2 minus V0. But we were told that those two vectors are linearly independent. So the coefficients of those vectors in this linear combination here must be zero. So minus C1 plus C2 equals zero and C2 equals zero. But if C2 is zero and C1 plus C2 is zero, that means C1 equals zero. So we're done. The only linear combination of these two vec new vectors that's linearly independent is the zero linear combination. Okay, any questions about this? Okay. Let's look at section 1.7. This is homework for Wednesday, but I want to start to It's a good way to review the material is to go through the problems. So in section 1.7, this is on bases and dimension. which is very, very, very important. So this just review a little bit. Let, suppose I'll just write V for Rn, that's my vector space. Let S be a subset of V, just a finite or infinite set of vectors. the set of all linear combinations of vectors in S is a subspace of V. Remember, a subspace of a vector space is a subset that contains the zero vector and is closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication. So for example, if S is the finite set of vectors, V1, W1, W2, up to W sub K, then linear combinations are C1, W1, C2, W2, plus C, K, W, K. And you look at the set of all linear combinations for all C1, C2, up to C sub K scalars, numbers. With all the linear combinations, and this is a subspace. And it's denoted, so this is, we call this the subspace generated by S. It's the smallest subspace of S, of, of the vector space V that contains S. And it's often denoted by S with angular brackets around it. So that is the notation for the subspace of the vector space generated by a set S of vectors. And so let W be any subspace of the vector space V. then what is called a basis. This is extremely important. A basis for W is a set S contained in W such that the following two properties are satisfied. One, S 
generates W. That means every vector in W is a linear combination of vectors in S and S is linearly independent. So a basis for a subspace, subspace would be the whole vector space, is a linearly independent subset that generates the vector space. So here is the simplest example. Suppose we let V be R2 and we let S be the set of two vectors, one, zero, and zero, one. I'll call this vector E1 and this vector E2. So if V is an R2, then V is some XY vector, which is X0 plus zero Y, which is X times one, zero plus Y times zero, one which is x e1 plus y e2. So every vector in v in R2 is a linear combination of e1 and e2. So therefore, the subspace generated by this set S is in fact the whole vector space. So this set of vectors generates R2. R2 consists of all linear combinations of these two vectors. And I claim S is also a linearly independent set of vectors. Because suppose C1E2 plus C2E2, C1E1 plus C2E2 is the zero vector. That means C1 times one zero plus C2 times zero one which is just the vector C1, C2 is the zero vector. And that's true if and only if C1 and C2 are zero. So the only linear combination of E1 and E2 that gives zero is, is the trivial linear combination. So these two vectors are linearly independent. So the set S is a basis for R2. So this S is a basis for R2. And in general, for example, in R3, by that S be the set of vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. For well, this E1, this E2, this E3, this is a basis for R3. Because every vector in R3 is a linear combination of these three vectors. So you cannot spend too much time trying to understand and absorb the definitions of linear independence, linear dependence, and basis for a vector space. Those and one more, which I'll talk about in a moment, to mention are truly fundamental and will be a big chunk of the midterm on Thursday. So a very important fact about linearly independent subsets is the following. This is a lemma, maybe lemma 1.4. It says the following, suppose we take the vector space Rn, um, let S be a linearly independent subset of V and let W be the subspace generated by S. That means the set of all linear combinations of vectors in S. So here is the vector space V. Sitting inside of it is W, which is the subspace generated by S. 
let V be in V minus W. So this notation means V is in dub, V is a vector in V, but V is not a vector in W. So if this is the subspace generated by S, that's W, V is some vector that's not in there. So the lemma says that then S union, this new vector V, is a bigger linearly independent subset of V. So how do we prove this? So if not, or suppose we have some linear combination W1 up to WK in S and some linear combination C1W1 plus C2W2 up to CKWK plus Actually, if I follow the notation in the text, it's fine. Let me call the scale where it's x, x is x1, w1, x2. So suppose w1 up to wk are in S, and x1, x2 up to xk and y are scalars, such that x1, w1 plus x2, w2, and so forth, up to xk, wk, plus y times this new vector v is the zero vector. I want to show every scale or equals zero. If y is different from zero, then I can solve this equation for v. I get y v is minus x1 w1 minus x2 w2 minus xk wk. And if y is different from zero, I can divide by it. So V is a linear combination of W1, W2 up to WK. That means V is in W, which is false. Because we chose V not to be in the subspace W. So therefore Y must equal zero. But then this linear combination is zero. But the W's are linearly independent. So X1, X2, XK, they all have to be zero. So the only time a linear combination of vectors in S together with V is zero is when it's the trivial linear combination with every coefficient equal to zero. So that proves that W, the set S with W adjoined, is a, with V adjoined is a linearly independent set. That's this result, which is a very, very, very useful result. And let me just again repeat the definition of a basis. set S of vectors is a basis for a subspace W if the following two conditions are satisfied. The subspace generated by S is W. That's what this notation means. That means every vector in W is a linear combination of vectors in S. And the set S is a linearly independent, independent, very important, independent set of vectors. That's what a basis is. And Right. 
Just one second. Okay, so this is a very big theorem. Every There's several big things. This is one. Um, so suppose we have the vector space Rn. <clears throat> Let S be a non-zero set of vectors. So this doesn't mean it's empty. It means the set of, the S is a set of vectors, and it's not just the zero vector. Um, and let W be the subspace generated by S. So every vector in W is a linear combination of vectors in S. The theorem says there exists a linearly independent subset of S. that also generates W. So here we have V, here we have a set S, and it generates some subspace W. We can throw away some vectors from S and still have a set that generates W, and this smaller set will have the property that it is linearly independent, no linear combination of the vectors in that subset can be equal to zero, except the trivial one. So let's start with, the, let's just prove the simplest case. So suppose S is a finite set. If you have a finite set, S contains only finitely many subsets. In particular, S contains only finitely many linearly independent subsets. For example, if V, if W is any vector in S not equal to zero, then the set containing just W is a subset of S and it's linearly independent because C times W is zero if and only if C is zero. So choose a maximal linearly independent subset of S. Call it S naught. So S naught is this maximal linearly independent subset in S. So what does that mean? Here's S, here's S naught, if you take any vector S, not an S naught, sorry, um, this means if you take any bigger set, so 
if S0 is contained in S1 is contained in S, and S1 is linearly independent, then in fact, S1 has to equal S0. You cannot find a strictly bigger subset of S that's linearly independent. That's what maximal means. It means it's as big as possible. And I claim that S0 generates the same subspace as S. Why is that? Because we have S0 is contained in S. So the subspace generated by S0 is contained in the subspace generated by S. Suppose they're different. Then there exists a vector V in S, which is not in S0. Excuse me one second. So by the previous lemma, S0 together with V is linearly independent. which contradicts the maximality of S0. So S0 must generate W, and we're done. So, any set, if you have a set that generates a sub, if you have any set of vectors, it generates a subspace and it always contains a subset that's the basis. It generates the subspace and in addition is linearly independent. And now we come to a very critical result. So this in the notes is theorem 1.13. Suppose V is Rn and W is a finitely generated subspace of V. So every finitely generated subspace has a finite basis, has many different bases. If V1 and V2 are bases for W, then they have the same number of elements. So in general, if you have a set X, this is just notation. X with vertical lines about it, also called the card of X, cardinality of X, is the number of elements in X. This also stands for cardinality. So in mathematics, another word for the number of elements in the set is the cardinality of the set. Let me spell it carefully. Cardinality. So X with absolute value signs around it or card X, both mean the cardinality of X or the number of elements in the set. So if you have X is equal to five, seven, and minus three, the cardinality of that, of that set is three because this set contains three different numbers. If X is a set consisting of the word dog and the word cat, then the cardinality of that set is two. The set contains two words, the number of things in the set.
So this is a very important set theorem. It says that every subspace not only has a basis, but all bases have the same number of elements. And what is the proof of this? Let's see. Suppose we let M1 be the cardinality of the basis B1 and M2 be the cardinality of the basis B2. So B1, it's a basis. So it generates the subspace W and it's linearly independent. So B1 generates the subspace W. B2 is certainly contained in W. and it's linearly independent. I claim the number of things in B2 can't be any bigger than the number of things in B1. Why is that? Let me put in the proof of that statement. So it goes back to a basic theorem on systems of homogeneous equations. So this is theorem 111 in the notes. Suppose V is equal to Rn and S is a finite subset of V and let W be the subspace generated by W. So V is the vector space Rn. This is the set of all n-dimensional column vectors. Vectors. S is a finite subset of V containing n vectors, and it generates the subspace W. Let V1, V2 up to V sub n be vectors in W or sequence of vectors in W. I claim that if n is bigger than m, then the sequence V1 up to Vn is linearly dependent. So if you have a subspace generated by m vectors <clears throat> and a sequence of n vectors, then is bigger than m, those n vectors must be linearly dependent. So what is the proof of that? So for all j going from one up to n, the vector vj is some linear combination of the w's, as to say, a1j, w1, a2j, w2, up to a, m, j, w, j, or with sigma notation, this is summation, i going from one up to m, a, i, j, w, i. Suppose some linear combination, c1, v1, up to c, n, v, n, equals zero. With sigma notation, this is summation, i goes from one up to n, c i v i.
let's see, but VI, sorry, summation J goes from one up to N, CJ, VJ is zero. But VJ can be written like this. So I have the zero vector, summation J goes from one up to N, CJ, VJ, is summation J goes from one up to N, CJ, times the vector vj, which is summation i goes from one up to m, aij, wi. These are finite summations. I can interchange the summations. This is summation i goes from one up to m, summation j goes from one up to n, aij, cj, wi. So this is some linear combination of the w's, and these are the coefficients. The question is, can you find non-zero scalars C1 up to Cn, scalars not all zero, to satisfy this equation? So we have to, the question is, we have for i going from one up to n, for i going from one up to m, we want to find scalars such that a i j c j is zero. J goes from one up to n. What is this? This is an equation in m variables. This is ai1 c1 up to a i m c m. And I have m such equations, a11 c1, a1 m c m equals zero and so forth. What is this? This is m homogeneous equations in, sorry, uh, yes, M equations in N variables. The variables are the C, C1 up to Cn. And this has a non-trivial solution. N bigger than M implies a non-zero solution. So this is a fundamental result. If you have n equations, sorry, n vectors in a subspace generated by m vectors, if you have n vector, if n is bigger than m, then the n vectors must be linearly dependent. That's this theorem 111. And the corollary of this says that S is a set of vectors contained in this vector space, Rn. And if V1 up to Vn is a set of vectors in the subspace generated by S, and these are linearly independent, and the number of such vectors cannot be bigger than M. So let's go back to the theorem 113. W finally generated subspace with two different bases, B1 and B2, which are finite. Then they have the same number of elements. And the proof is B1 
generates W, B2 linearly independent. So by that corollary, the number of things in B2 is the most the number of things in B1. But B2 also generates, and B1 is linearly independent. And again, by that same corollary, the number of things in B1 is the most the number of things in B2. And if you have two integers, each less than or equal to the other, B1 equals B2. And this number, which is the cardinality of a basis for a subspace, is what is called the dimension of the subspace. And this is ultra important. So as much time as you have, you should spend studying these concepts of linear dependence and linear independence, basis and dimension for subspaces of a vector space. This is an essential part of linear algebra and will play a big role in the midterm on Thursday. Okay. Okay, that's all we're doing for today.